I believe that, what was it? Magnesium contributes to 200 or 300 essential biological uh, bodily functions. And zinc contributes to a couple hundred as well, including um, immune system health, wound healing, DNA synthesis, testosterone production acting as a aromatized inhibitor to a certain extent, or at least keep serum estradiol levels in range, so at least you don't wake up with a moon face if you're supplementing with testosterone. Moving over to vitamin B6 P5P, which stands for peroxidal 5 phosphate, 25 to 50 milligrams before bed. I'm sure many of you guys are familiar that vitamin B6, P5P can help, help to increase dopamine levels and reduce prolactin levels downstream. Those dosages range between 200 milligrams to 300 milligrams per day. But to improve sleep quality, vitamin B6, P5P, a low dose of 25 to 50 milligrams before bed is more than sufficient because uh, the P5P variety of B6 helps to produce serotonin, which ultimately produces or contributes to melatonin production downstream. So let's say you take a combination of 5-HTP with vitamin B6, P5P. The 5-HTP will be the building block for serotonin and the P5P will help to produce serotonin and melatonin downstream. So you get this sedating, relaxing and anxiolytic effect by combining 5-HTP with um, B6, P5P. So many fives and so many sixes. <laughs> so, um, this combination will um, produce serotonin, serotonin in the beginning, and then that gets converted into melatonin, helping you to stay asleep. You can find this combination of vitamin B6, P5P, and a lot of over-the-counter supplement stacks. I think it's highly beneficial. Um, if you want to experiment with this by yourself, feel free to go ahead. You might even increase dopamine levels if you're supplementing a little bit more royally, let's say 200 milligrams per day. Of course, you know, P5P is associated with a multitude of conditions when you supplement it at higher dosages for longer periods of time. So don't do that. I would rather stick towards the low end of P5P supplementation because, again, vitamin B6 is found in many food sources. And ultimately, your body will synthesize adequate or decent amounts of the peroxidal 5 phosphate variant of B6 coming from your food sources, right? So don't overdo it. A low dose goes a very long way if you combine that with things like 5-HTP or L-tryptophan. And it's also important to note that vitamin B6, P5P, just like most of the B vitamins, can help to regulate homocysteine levels. Now, homocysteine, when it's chronically elevated, can actually induce insomnia by keeping you awake the entire night through or exacerbate or even induce sleep apnea. Now, it's a little bit positively correlated because if you have chronic insomnia, or sleep apnea, uh, homocysteine levels can certainly increase just because of that effect, because you're now chronically inflamed. So if you're chronically inflamed, um, you can see that from your homocysteine levels and your high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels. And supplementing with vitamin B6, P5P, let's say 50 to 100 milligrams if homocysteine is really that high, and a general B100 complex, which contains all of the B vitamins in either 100 milligrams or 100 micrograms, then homocysteine levels over time will certainly come down and then your insomnia or sleep apnea hopefully will resolve itself or at least improve to a certain extent, right? And otherwise, there's always a sleep study to get your sleep apnea diagnosed and a CPAP or an APAP prescribed. But we'll save that for part three of this deep dive video series. Moving over to 5-HTP, which stands for 5-hydroxytryptophan. Again, those just range between 50 to up to 300 milligrams before bed. But from my personal experience, I feel that 100 milligrams 5-HTP is more than enough. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. Don't take 5-HTP or L-tryptophan for that matter in combination with SSRIs because that can contribute to serotonin syndrome. So when I took fluvoxamine in the past, I didn't supplement with 5-HTP. I did supplement with L-tryptophan up to 3,000 milligrams per day, but I found it wasn't really necessary because I got a decent amount of serotonin in my synapses due to the fluvoxamine, uh, which was titrating upwards from 25 milligrams up to 100 milligrams per day, which I've now discontinued at the end of last year. Um, I found at the doses of 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams fluvoxamine per day that L-tryptophan was beneficial. But after that, I started feeling a little bit weird, so I took that out. So if you're currently not on SSRIs on Mayo inhibitors, then you can look into 5-HTP and L-tryptophan. It kind of depends on what you prefer. I prefer 5-HTP at a lower dose of, let's say, 100 milligrams before bed to increase serotonin production and melatonin secretion downstream and otherwise maybe dosages of 500 up to a thousand milligrams l-tryptophan before bed 
if you feel that that's more beneficial to help um, produce serotonin and again melatonin downstream right serotonin and melatonin will help you fall asleep and stay asleep promote relaxation improve sleep quality etc we already mentioned that a little bit earlier in this video now something what a lot of people don't realize but what i mentioned in the mitochondrial support stack if you haven't watched it you should i'll link it at the end of this one the nicotinamide mononucleotide nmn and nicotinamide riboside nr doses ranging from 300 milligrams up to a thousand milligrams over the day can improve your nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide plus levels including nadp and nadph all of these help with the enzymatic reactions by acting as an electron donor in all of the enzymatic reactions within the body so you want to convert one thing into the next nad plus nadp or nadph and you need supplemental nmn or nr to raise nad plus levels and nadp and nadph levels in the body systemically so after supplementing with nicotinamide mononucleotides up to a thousand milligrams per day i take a little bit less now around 700 milligrams per day my sleep quality yeah on par with megadosing melatonin even though i didn't wake up um clinically depressed on uh, copious amounts of nmn even though it's substantially more expensive so my wallet is depressed but my body is not so if you have to make a head-on-head -head comparison with an effective dose of melatonin versus an effective dose of nicotinamide mononucleotides and it's a very hard comparison because both of them are highly beneficial and ideally you take both right for its antioxidant benefits and its sleep quality improving benefits versus its um, overall um, anti-aging and well-being benefits right of the nicotinamide mononucleotides personally if i have to choose i would go with nicotinamide mononucleotide because i feel more rejuvenated and i feel that my sleep quality is better than a higher dose of melatonin i don't wake up groggy i wake up feeling energetic but again a combination of let's say 500 milligrams nmn and uh, three maybe six milligrams melatonin um that's pretty much heaven <laughs> when it comes to sleep quality again watch that mitochondrial support stack it will change your life if you have the financial means to follow through with it and again we'll save the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide plus intravenous administrations for the medication and drug video which is going to be part two right that's an iv administration that's not really an over-the-counter supplement moving on to magnesium you can choose by yourself which form has the highest absorbability the highest bioavailability whether that's glycinate bisglycinate citrate or another form that's entirely up to you the best form you, of magnesium you can get 200 to 400 milligrams before bed because magnesium helps with relaxation and also helps to regulate cortisol levels especially at night now normally cortisol levels kind of peak in the morning and then somewhere in the afternoon let's say around four o'clock based on a normal circadian rhythm but again if you sleep outside of your uh, circadian rhythm and your cortisol levels might are coming up when you're actually going to bed like is what happening in my case right i go to bed at 4 a.m then magnesium is very beneficial because this keeps this cortisol suppressed and now you can actually sleep a lot better now those just range again 200 to 400 milligrams personally i take 200 milligrams magnesium bisglycinate with each meal i don't notice that my cortisol levels are chronically suppressed due to this um, extensive supplementation of magnesium um, but the relaxation is certainly there now i'm not relaxed during the day to the point i can't function during work um, but i do notice that with my last magnesium supplement at the end of the day which is just 200 milligrams um, my relaxation and overall um, ability to fall asleep is certainly improved now you can say the same thing for zinc supplementation zinc glycinate bisglycinate citrate or picolinate 15 to 30 milligrams before bed in combination with magnesium up to 400 milligrams both of these are known to kind of regulate and reduce your cortisol secretion again assuming you're sleeping through your circadian rhythm both zinc and magnesium contribute to melatonin production so that helps you fall asleep and stay asleep throughout the night i believe that what was it magnesium contributes to 200 or 300 essential biological bodily functions and zinc contributes to a couple hundred as well including um, immune system health wound healing dna synthesis testosterone production acting as a aromatized inhibitor to a certain extent or at least keep serum estradiol levels in range so at least you don't wake up with a moon face if you're supplementing with testosterone replacement or full hormone replacement therapy right zinc and magnesium pretty much essential especially magnesium in the context of muscular contractions calcium helps to contract your muscles 
and magnesium helps to relax your muscles just like magnesium helps you relax at the end of the day to improve your overall sleep quality. And just keep in mind, guys, that higher dosages of magnesium can cause diarrhea or gastrointestinal upset. So start low, maybe 100 milligrams or even 50 milligrams magnesium citrate or some of the other forms with meals. And again, if you take a high dose at the end of the day, let's say 200 to 400 milligrams magnesium citrate or glycinate or bisglycinate, you might get diarrhea the next day. Now, this isn't the end of the world when you're currently in the off season and you're eating a boatload of foods and you're kind of full at the end of the day. So, you know, mega dosing magnesium at the end of the day might help with evacuation in the bathroom the next day, just like Sinat keeps a little bit of uh, fluid within the intestinal tract. So a combination of Sinat and a little bit of psyllium husk fiber and a pretty strong, potent and high dose of magnesium. Um, yeah, well, you get the gist of it, right? You know that the next day you're going to be emptied out completely. So um, experiment with low doses, just build your way up. Don't overdo it from the start because again, explosive diarrhea might occur. And it's also important to keep uh, in mind that higher dosages of zinc can interfere with the absorption of other essential trace minerals like copper, for example. So if you mega dose your zinc, but you don't supplement with copper, or you don't get that in the form of a multivitamin or you're injecting copper through GHK copper, for example. Um, yeah, you might want to supplement a little bit of copper in so you don't get copper deficient. And now your serum iron levels go sky high because that um, is a downstream effect of being copper deficient. So again, keep everything in check. Don't overdo it. Um, a low dose of zinc and magnesium goes a very long way. Now, besides that, 